Well, hey there, everybody. Welcome to Gather and Go, the podcast where we help you plan, promote, and lead better trips. My name is Brian Jewell. I'm your host, and I am so glad you decided to spend some time with us today. We have a lot to talk about, so let's get right to it. Our featured conversation today is going to be with Hannah Smith of STR. Uh, she and her company spend a lot of time researching and benchmarking what's going on in the hospitality industry, particularly what's going on with hotel pricing, and she's going to help us make some sense of the unbelievable pricing environment that we are finding in the hotel world today. You're not going to want to miss that. First, though, let's get into some travel news. Now, normally in this part of the show, uh, I like to highlight some travel news that you may have missed from the week or two previous. But uh, this time, I actually want to talk about some travel news that probably you have seen uh, if you pay attention to the news at all. And certainly if you are plugged into the travel and hospitality industry news, then you heard uh, last week uh, that the United States is finally waiving its COVID testing requirement for international arrivals. Uh, for the past two years, anybody who has wanted to fly into the United States, whether they were Americans or they were people coming to the U.S. from other countries, they had to take a COVID test, uh, take a negative COVID test within 24 hours of their departure. Now, for quite a while, uh, people throughout the travel industry, whether it's on the hotel side, the airline side, uh, organizations like U.S. Travel, U.S. Uh, TOA, uh, they have all been lobbying the government to get rid of this testing requirement, saying that it is depressing travel. Well, uh, last week, the Biden administration announced that they are, in fact, waiving the testing requirement from here on out. I guess waiving is not the best word. They're eliminating the testing requirement and uh, immediately the entire travel industry uh, celebrated and welcomed that news. So uh, you've probably heard about that. I want to give you just a little bit of analysis, break down that announcement and talk a bit about what it means for travel, what it means for the industry, what it means for you as a travel planner. First of all, this decision is a win for the freedom of travel overall. Uh, I can't stress enough how important it is that Americans and people coming to the U.S. from abroad finally have the full freedom of travel restored. You know, this is something that we took for granted before the pandemic. If you ask me, it's something we should take for granted. It should be so fundamental and basic as a human right that we don't ever have to worry about it being taken away. Uh, you know, during the pandemic, there were lots of restrictions put in place that fairly or some would argue unfairly really, really hurt travel and tourism. Many of the restrictions put on place almost seem to target travel. And so the fact that this testing requirement is being waived, well, it's kind of the last chapter in uh, those requirements uh, and those unfair regulations finally uh, going away. Uh, and so that's something for us all to celebrate. Uh, people can disagree about whether those travel restrictions did any good, but I think what we can all agree on is that they also did significant, significant harm to our industry. So the fact that the final regulation is going away, that is a win no matter how you slice it. Now let's talk about some other winners in particular from this decision. Number one, Americans who want to travel abroad win. Now, I don't think there's a lot of people out there who decided not to travel abroad simply because they didn't want to have to take a COVID test when they came home. But getting that COVID test within 24 hours of your planned departure was a hassle for international travelers. It was a hassle for tour operators or for companies that took people abroad. So for anyone who wants to come home from a trip like that, this is a big win. It removes a barrier and it makes travel easier. And that's something we should always be striving to do. Uh, tour companies are also big winners here. Uh, for the past couple of years, tour companies that were operating internationally had to plan time in their itineraries and find sites where they could take groups of people uh, for mass testing. Uh, that brought additional expense. Some companies passed that expense on to the travelers uh, through the price of the tour. Some companies had the travelers pay for the testing themselves, but it brought additional expense and it uh, added a lot of additional time to itineraries. And that's time that people didn't get to spend enjoying the destination 
because they were spending it testing. So it's a win for those travelers who get to enjoy the full length of their vacation instead of standing in some line for a test. It's a win for the tour company that doesn't have to worry about uh, facilitating that test. It's also a win for international travelers who want to visit the U.S. Now, there are many different regulations in many different countries, and uh, I'm not going to say that this one change in America is going to necessarily open the floodgates of international travelers because those people have many other factors to think about. Uh, their own countries have entry and exit requirements uh, related to COVID. So uh, this is not going to be a silver bullet. But for international travelers who were waiting to visit the U.S., possibly until this kind of uh, regulation was relaxed, this is a win for them. Also, big winners here are airlines. Now, if you've been flying domestically in the U.S. or uh, shopping for airfares for later this year, you know that uh, flights are pretty full. Uh, airfares are rising. Domestic flights have been doing pretty well. In fact, uh, air traffic domestically has uh, just about caught up to where it was pre-pandemic. Internationally, though, airlines have not been doing nearly as well. International arrivals uh, and departures have been depressed since before the pandemic. They are not doing uh, nearly as well as domestic flights. So you can imagine how much the airlines cheered this announcement because uh, international traffic is a big part of what makes their money. Finally, Anybody who sells travel to inbound international groups is going to benefit from this. Uh, you may not think about it a lot, but there are many destinations, attractions, hotels, many members of our tourism community that for a long time have depended on international inbound visitation to help them keep their businesses open and thriving. That hasn't been there for a couple years. This policy decision gets them one step closer to the kind of recovery that they are hoping for, the kind of recovery that many of us in the domestic market are already seeing. And so we can share this decision on their behalf because uh, it certainly helps get them closer to where they need to be. Now, there are also some considerations that we need to keep in mind here. Uh, number one, uh, if this increases air traffic into the U.S. or the demand for flights into the U.S. or international flights in general, we have to ask, do the airlines have crew capacity to meet that international demand? Because already we're seeing flights canceled around the country because there's just not enough crew to go around. So as international demand picks up, what is that going to do to flight availability or flight prices here in the U.S. or abroad? I don't know. It remains to be seen, but it's a consideration. Another thing to think about, does America's hospitality infrastructure have the capacity to serve an influx of international inbound travelers? I don't know. We're going to talk about uh, labor issues in our upcoming featured interview. Uh, if we don't have the labor force to serve domestic travelers the way we want to, can we serve international travelers the way we want to? That remains to be seen, and it's something we need to think about. Finally, what will a recovering international market mean for airline and hotel pricing, which are already on the rise? Well, I can't help to think it means that those prices may go up further. Now, that's how the markets work, but it's something we need to think about. All right, moving on to today's road tip. You know, if you are involved in the type of travel uh, that has you moving hotels from night to night, or you might use two or three hotels over the course of a tour, maybe you found yourself in this kind of situation. Uh, you end up with some dirty laundry that you have to pack along with your clean laundry when you're leaving one hotel and moving to the next. Now, if it's just, you know, everyday dirty laundry, that might not be such a big deal. But if you have been outside and you got some clothes really muddy, uh, maybe you've been to the fitness center and you got some clothes really sweaty. Maybe you use the hotel pool and you've got a swimsuit that's still a little bit wet. There are things that can happen that can leave you with some laundry that you don't really want mixed up with all your clean clothes when you move from one hotel to the next. Well, there are a variety of ways to deal with this. Some people I know just bring a bunch of like plastic grocery bags. They stuff them in their suitcases before they leave and then they use those bags to toss their dirty clothes in to keep those separate from their clean clothes let me tell you what i like to do because it's even easier if you go to most hotel closets and look at the hangers in the closets you're likely to find a hanger that has a plastic bag and a laundry price list attached to it now i'm going to be honest with you I've never sent my clothes out to be cleaned at a hotel. Uh, there's a variety of reasons for that, not the least of which is those price lists look really high and I'm not the kind of guy that wants to spend a ton of money to have my clothes washed when I can just wash them when I get home. 
Now, you might see that and think, oh, well, this bag is intended for laundry service. And you would be right. But you don't have to use that bag just for laundry service. In fact, you can grab the bag, you can leave the laundry price list, and you can pack those dirty, messy, wet, muddy clothes in the laundry service bag, put them in your suitcase, and not have to worry at all about the stinky clothes rubbing off on the clean clothes. That's what I do, and that is your road tip for today. Now, we're just about to get into our featured conversation with Hannah Smith. But first, I want to let you know about an opportunity we have coming up for a familiarization tour in Alabama. This is October 25th through 29th. You can join me and uh, other members of our team along with the Alabama Department of Tourism for a fam tour that's going to go to Montgomery, Tuskegee, and Mobile. Uh, We're going to see sites like the USS Alabama, which is a decommissioned World War II battleship that's now permanently moored in Mobile. We're going to visit the Legacy Museum in Montgomery that deals with the history of slavery and racism in America, as well as the civil rights movement. And we're going to visit the Tuskegee Airmen National Historic Site and learn about the heroism of these famous black World War II pilots uh, at this great museum in Tuskegee. That's uh, three experiences among many, many others that are going to make this a fantastic trip. So if you are a group travel planner, we would love to have you register to attend. You can do that at grouptravelleader.com slash Alabama fam or just look for that link in the show notes. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, you'll hear my featured conversation with Hannah Smith. Don't go anywhere. All right, so if you're looking for even more reasons to make plans to visit Savannah, look no further. From the moment you arrive, you'll be greeted with moss-draped live oak trees, fresh coastal breezes, and enchanting history around every cobblestone street. Savannah strikes a delicate balance between hip and historic, casual but cool, elegant yet approachable. Spend the day exploring the city's illustrious culture, roaming through the green city squares while sipping on your go-to cocktail before hopping a trolley to your next adventure. The best experiences happen when you let Savannah take you along for the ride. You never know what characters you'll meet or what's in store for your next tour. And that's just the way they like it. See why groups of all sizes fall in love with Savannah at visitsavannah.com. All right, everybody. My guest today is a senior consultant with STR, a company specializing in data benchmarking, analytics, and marketplace insights in the hospitality sector. Now, she uses STR's extensive database to help clients understand and evaluate industry trends. Hannah Smith, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So, uh, listen, is it just me or are hotel prices higher than maybe they have ever been? They are. Uh, we have continued to hit new highs in recent months. So it's not even that we're talking about recovering back to 2019 levels. Now we're seeing just record high levels industry wide at this point. Um, Now, of course, the caveat there is inflation. And once you adjust for inflation, we aren't quite seeing those same historic highs. Um, But just in April, which is the most recent data that STR has available as of this recording, Looking at April, we actually did exceed on a nominal basis those 2019 ADR levels. So it's not all inflationary based. We are seeing some of that real ADR growth of um, of those rates just really being pushed. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there, and I want to get to quite a bit of it. Let's start with the basics, though. How does a company like yours uh, gather this data? What are the key numbers that you're looking for, and how do you compile it to get these national averages? Absolutely. Good place to start. Um, So our company was founded really based in this idea of data benchmarking. So Mm -hmm. we collect data directly from the hotels, from all the major brands, as well as a lot of independent hotels as well. And we're collecting that data and then reporting it back in aggregate. So the way the business started was looking just an individual hotel level. How are your competitors doing? You know, Mm -hmm. your five hotels that are around you that you always think of as your competitors getting a better understanding of in aggregate, how they're performing. Yeah. But then once we started to build up uh, such an extensive database industry wide, that allows us to do a lot of that industry level reporting that you're talking about. And then certainly diving into market level and other industry segments. And as far as the data that we're collecting, the 
core of the business is looking at supply, demand, and revenue. Just mm. a simple three data points of how many rooms do you have to sell? How many did you sell? And then how much total did you sell them for? Um, and then we have certainly other data points within that, looking at maybe some segmentation data. And then we also collect now monthly P&L data from a good number of hotels as well. So getting to understand some of that profitability data as well. Yeah, great. So you have uh, thousands, I would assume, of hotels around the U.S. Uh, reporting to you. What is uh, the number that you are looking for from them that allows you to say uh, prices are at an all-time high? Maybe not including inflation, but um, you know, just mm -hmm. the absolute value of those dollars is at an all-time high. What is that kind of key metric you're looking at? So that metric is called average daily rate. We shorten that to ADR. Mm -hmm. So that's just looking at the total amount of revenue that you're uh, generating just from rooms. So in that number, we're not looking at F and B spend or anything mm. like that food and beverage. Yeah. Um, we're just looking at that room rate. Um, so that total rooms revenue divided by the total number of rooms that you're selling is how gotcha. we're getting that ADR figure. Okay, great. So uh, 2019 by all uh, accounts was perhaps the best year on record for hotels. Is that right? Yes, we had started to see occupancy starting to soften in 2019. So that, I mean, I think it was down maybe 0.1% um, okay. or something like that from 2018. Okay. Uh, but when you're looking at uh, RevPAR, which is revenue per available room, mm -hmm. so that instead of looking at the total revenue divided by occupied rooms, you're instead looking at the total available rooms. Mm. Um, and that's kind of our, our main industry uh, metric that we're looking at when we're trying to get a a good understanding of both um, occupancy and ADR yeah. kind of combined together to that rev par figure that was at its highest levels in 2019. Gotcha. So in a year like 2019, what was the occupancy you were seeing sort of uh, across the country? It was around 66%, mm -hmm. a little over 66%. So each night you're looking at two thirds of hotel rooms across the U S were full. Gotcha. Okay. And then 2020, that obviously just tanks, right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, like nothing we've ever seen before, certainly in a lot of ways, but in the hospitality industry, you know, don't want to use unprecedented. I know that everyone's, everyone's sick of it, but yeah. um, yes, certainly nothing we've ever seen before for the industry. Yeah. How low did it go in 2020? Um, when you look at those April numbers, I mean, pretty much the only people traveling were, people that had to travel. You had traveling nurses that were mm. traveling to the hardest hit spots in the early pandemic, places like Seattle was one of the early places. Um, and then New York really got hit hard in those early months. If if you think back to those those really dark days in the early pandemic of just how how scary and locked down everything was, um, it really was very limited in terms of the travel that we were seeing. I don't have, you know, that number offhand. Sure. But really the bottom fell out of the industry in, in April. Yeah. Yeah. And so moving into 2021, we see a, a halting recovery, I'm sure kind of in, in fits and starts, but was it enough to mm -hmm. sort of get a, a benchmark out of that year? Yeah, we started to see, especially in the summer, a lot of that really strong leisure demand started to come back mm -hmm. um, where people felt a little more comfortable. The first vaccines were rolled out. So people started to feel a bit better about, planning those vacations for the summer, getting back out on the road. So we did see a lot of that leisure demand coming back on mm -hmm. weekends and long weekends um, and in those leisure destinations. So depending on where you were located in the U.S., July might have felt almost normal last year just yeah. based on um, what kind of demand was out there on the road. And then as we entered the fall, it slowed down a little bit, kids back in school, and we didn't see the normal pickup we would have of, say, conventions and business travel that would kind of fill that void. So slowed down through the fall and winter, and then we've now started to pick right back up again. Yeah. And so you're forecasting for 2022 that obviously we're going to far uh, exceed 2021's uh, occupancy rates. Uh, in terms of occupancy, do you see us getting close to that 2018-2019 uh, level or is there there's still a ways to go? There's still a bit of a ways to go. Um, we're certainly going to need that 
group demand and business demand kind of base of the industry to come back in order to see that full occupancy recovery. Um, right now, our most recent forecast, which was released a couple of weeks ago, we're looking at occupancy recovery by around 2024. Okay. Um, and that's also the same time that we're expecting that inflation adjusted ADR and RevPAR to also come back. So a couple more years before we start to see that real recovery. Yeah. But at an individual hotel level, you could be talking about a difference of, you know, just a few room nights a month um, yeah. that you could be off. Okay. Yeah. Well, that makes a lot of sense. So m- maybe this is a naive way of thinking. Um, it, it seems to me if occupancy is still a little bit low, if demand still um, is has not caught up with where it was, if there's still excess supply, it seems like that should be keeping rates lower, but that that's not the case. So what are the other factors going on in the world that are driving rates up, even though occupancy is not, you know, at historic highs? Yeah. When we look back historically at the other major downturns that the industry has seen after 2001 and after 2008, we've seen that real ADR has taken six to eight years to come back after a downturn. Wow. Um, and the main difference between those downturns and up to this point, at least the current downturn for the industry is that those previous downturns were really broadly financially. um, They were financial downturns. So it wasn't necessarily something specifically about travel that Mm. was impacted. It was that all budgets were cut for households and businesses. So travel is going to be impacted by that. So when you're looking at a financial downturn like that, there may be the inclination to say, oh, my competitor up the street, they just slashed their rates by $15. I better do that too to try and grasp whatever demand is out there. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we saw back in 2008 is just kind of a race to the bottom of hotels just trying to meet where their competitors were and uh, just kind of fighting for scraps almost. Yeah. Yeah. But then what we saw over the last couple of years is there weren't even those those scraps to fight over. And anybody that was traveling, especially in 2020, in those early months, they weren't traveling because they wanted to travel. They were traveling because they had to. Yeah. So at that point, a lower rate isn't going to incentivize someone to come to your hotel. If they don't feel comfortable, then they don't feel comfortable traveling and yeah. charging five bucks a night isn't going to change their comfort level. It's probably... Right probably going to have the opposite desired effect on their comfort level if they see that. Um, So really we just didn't see the same kind of rate slashing that we saw. So rates never fell as far as maybe they did back in 2008. So they haven't had as far to climb back up, but also Mm. I think it's a difference in, in what was actually driving the downturn and how hotels have then responded to that to say, now that we did see that pickup of demand in 2021, if someone wants to travel, they're willing to pay to travel now because they just didn't have the chance before. So the things that happened in 2020, the events were so cataclysmic that normal supply and demand levers were almost irrelevant, at least for a time. Yes, absolutely. Wow. Wow. That's incredible. Okay. So here we are in 2022 and uh, people are shopping for hotels in, you know, let's say Nashville on a Thursday night and, and seeing quotes for $300, $400 at a, um, a medium service uh, chain. Uh, Now Nashville was a popular place with tourists. Um, Mm -hmm. Is that rate and and granted Nashville hotels were pricey, you know, five years ago, but is is that rate in Nashville going to be substantially higher because uh, tourism is recovering faster than business travel uh, because leisure is recovering first, or is it just really across all segments? Yeah. So that's an interesting example looking at Nashville. Um, You know, another market that comes to mind when we're thinking of, ones that have really done well over the last year is, you know, basically pick a market in Florida. It right. probably did really, really well Yeah. Um, because it was a beach destination. If people wanted to go on, you know, ordinarily, maybe they'd go on a cruise or go to the Caribbean. That wasn't as much of an option over the past couple of years. So, yeah. okay, we'll go down to the keys instead. Yeah. Um, so it really depends on what area of the industry you're looking at in terms of that, ADR performance and how much we expect that that's going to stay where it is. Um, 
I think once we see international travel open up a little bit, Mm -hmm. you may see a little bit of softening in some of those leisure leisure destinations that may have been just a substitute for an international destination. But then the flip side of that is we have a lot of international travelers that haven't been able to come to the U.S. in the past couple of years. So there is that flip side of we have a whole world of people that are just as eager to travel to the U.S. as we are to maybe travel internationally from the U.S. So, you know, just the demand to some of these areas is driving ADR. You know, Mm -hmm. we already touched a little bit on the inflationary piece. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you're seeing higher prices at the grocery store, higher gas prices. You're also going to see higher hotel rates. Um, But we are now starting to see a little bit of that rear real ADR growth, like I mentioned in, in April. Yeah. So I'm interested in this, um, this idea of inflation, uh, driving hotel rates a little bit. It, it would seem to me that a lot of uh, hotels costs are fixed. Certainly not all of them, but many of them are fixed. Uh, the, those upfront investments of many millions of dollars that it takes to start a hotel, uh, as opposed to, you know, a, a gas station or a restaurant who almost all of their costs are variable. Uh, so is inflation driving the cost of hotels, uh, in the same way that it is say at the grocery store, or is it playing a lesser role in that? It certainly is playing a big role. Um, and not just inflation, but, uh, the other piece that we haven't talked about yet is labor, mm. which was a big conversation in the industry. Even pre pandemic, there was conversations of labor shortages, um, even before the pandemic and, certainly that's been exacerbated by the labor shortages that we're seeing um, really across the U.S. and just that really tight labor market. So when we look at a lot of those variable costs that are going into a hotel, you do have some of those same costs that a restaurant would see. Mm -hmm. And particularly if you're looking at a full service hotel that does have that restaurant component. Sure. Um, So you do have a lot of that inflationary pressure that is still is still affecting hotels. And then you also have, of course, that, that labor component of um, some of those higher wages in order to keep and attract some of those workers. Yeah. Yeah. Now in uh, previous years, I I think back to, you know, maybe 2007, 2008 was the last time we started to see gas prices uh, reach the level they're at now. And the conventional wisdom back then certainly was that uh, as gas prices go up, leisure travel goes down and uh, we would expect maybe to see uh, hotel rates uh, tweaked uh, in response to that. Uh, Here we are knocking on the door of $5 a gallon gas in many parts of the country and it doesn't seem to be stemming the tide for leisure travel. So do you expect these rates to hold kind of regardless of what the cost of fuel does? Yeah, I mean, I don't, it's tough to tell where that breaking point will be and if there is a breaking point, but, you know, we've seen, you know, we've been talking about hotel rates going up. If you've booked a flight recently, you've seen that uh, flight prices are way up right now. Yeah. So as of now, we haven't seen considerable pressure, this considerable downward pressure on rates because right now demand is still continuing to build week after week. So as of right now, we haven't seen an impact. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, it's possible that if this continues for much longer, you may, you may see that impact. And I don't know if that's going to impact more of those drive to leisure destinations that actually did really well when you mm-hmm. look back at 2020. Um, or if that's just going to be a, a broader impact of tightening budgets all around. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So let's break this down a little bit more into um, whether it's regional lines that some of these trends break down along or, um, you know, types of travel. Are you seeing certain destinations that are able to uh, do better in recovering that rev par than others right now? And, and what is the unifying thread among those destinations that are doing really well? Yeah, really that unifying thread is, Um, if they have a strong demand driver, that's going to bring leisure travel. Mm. So obviously Florida, the whole, the whole state's a beach. And so they did really well because that's uh, such a, such a drive for that leisure demand. And when you look at some of the cities that have done well, um, a lot of those have a strong leisure component. Um, Another factor is if there's any sort of steady base of, 
demand coming from another source. One of the markets I'm thinking of is Norfolk Mm. is one that was always at the top for the past couple of years. And that's just because they have that steady uh, demand of military travel. Sure. Um, That if there's a market that's really reliant on group business, some of those conventions um, and that business travel, those are the markets that are going to be struggling to recover. So you look at say San Francisco or Chicago, those are the ones that are still kind of lagging behind the pack. Mm. And then even within a city, if you dive in deeper, maybe some of those suburbs that have maybe some more diverse um, demand drivers are doing a little bit better, but those central business districts are really struggling to come back. Interesting. So it's not about, you know, uh, the South is doing great, but the upper Midwest, not so much. It's really about this destination is huge for leisure. The other one was huge for business and business is just lagging in the recovery. Yes, absolutely. I mean, to that upper Midwest point, if you look at some of the locations around like Lake Michigan, mm-hmm. those areas did great because mm. great leisure destination, great place to escape to in the summer. So really, it just depends on um, what they have in terms of demand drivers and whether that's something that people want to do. Yeah. So bringing back that group business, the conventions and uh, and business travel in general, I know that's a, that's a nut that you know people all over the country are trying to crack. But I assume, again, that's one of those things that uh, pricing can't necessarily bring that back, right? I mean, a hotel can't, or a chain even, you know, Marriott or Sheraton can't run a, a business travel or a convention special and all of a sudden convince, you know, a Fortune 500 company to start holding meetings again. Is that right? Exactly. Um, there's a lot that goes into that into the pricing of groups where usually the booking window for a group, it's so much longer than what you're looking at for your average leisure traveler that, you know, maybe they're looking a couple months out versus a group. You could be booking that up to four or five years out. um, If it's, you know, one of those big citywide conventions. Yeah. So a lot goes into that, into that pricing and groups historically have always been the lower ADR segment, the lower priced segment between those and the transient rooms. Yeah. So right now where transient rates is really what's driving a lot of that rate growth. So a lot of that leisure demand. Mm-hmm. So hotels almost aren't incentivized to go back to that group demand. If they know that it's going to be a loader, lower ADR segment, they're struggling to have to you know cover the higher wages for their staff and they may not be fully staffed up yet. So they may not even be able to accommodate that group demand if they can't staff their their banquet center or, um, you know, those, those meeting rooms. So certainly some of those really big box hotels that rely heavily on that group demand, will be happy to see those groups come back. That ancillary spend is a really big part of their profitability. Mm -hmm. Um, but for some of those hotels that maybe they just do some small meetings, they don't have a ton of meeting space. They may not be incentivized to go after that group demand if it's, not going to make sense for them if they can, you know, make up for the difference in ancillary spend with a higher rate for a leisure guest, then that's going to be where they go. Yeah, that makes total sense. And, you know, it's interesting. Uh, many of our listeners uh, plan travel for leisure groups. So tour operators, mm-hmm. uh, folks like that who are booking, you know, uh, 20, 30 rooms at a time it, it, in good times. They were booking 20 or 30 rooms per night at a time, which doesn't quite, you know, qualify maybe as that. Uh, convention size booking, but it's a nice piece of business for a, a sales director mm-hmm. at, at a, you know, most hotels would, would love to have that business. But we're hearing from many of them that uh, the leisure demand is so high that they're even having trouble getting those sales directors to return their calls for the tour bookings. Uh, we're also hearing that they're struggling to get the same level of service that they were getting, things like baggage handling uh, that uh, were important parts of uh, the group tour service package that hotels would provide. So uh, I have to imagine uh, on the service end of it, uh, labor is playing a large part in that. So are we in a situation where people are paying more and more, but having to settle for less service than what they're used to. Yeah, that is the trade-off right now. I think if we look back to a couple of years ago, you know, I mentioned there were already labor shortages that the industry was really concerned about and just a really high turnover rate, really high burnout rate. And then we hit the pandemic and the industry almost went into survival mode Mm -hmm. of, you know, whatever we have to do to either 
stay open or some hotels chose to temporarily close just because it wasn't, uh, wasn't worth staying open. Yeah. So it just went into survival mode of, okay, we only have five employees left. We had to lay off everyone else. So everyone has to do whatever we have to do to get this going. You know, you hear stories of general managers in here stripping beds and, um, you know, cleaning rooms just because it was survival mode. But at a certain point, I think we have to get out of that mindset as an industry because that's just going to exacerbate those burnout problems that we already had. Right. Of if we're if we're not fully staffed back up, but we're still asking um, the same level of productivity with fewer employees, that's just kind of a recipe for burnout. Um, but you are seeing some of those services being cut back, whether that's a greater adoption of those mobile check-ins that we were Mm -hmm. already seeing uh, as a trend in the industry. Certainly cutting back on housekeeping is a really common trend right now of um, only getting housekeeping when you check out or Mm -hmm. on request only. Um, And then some of that F and B, maybe they only have one restaurant open or maybe they're switching to grab and go for breakfast and they're only doing seated lunch and dinner or, you know, other limitations are ways that they're, cutting back to be able to at least stay open with uh, fewer staff, but it's not necessarily leading to the same guest experience. Yeah. So um, I know this may be more speculative uh, than data driven, but I mean, do you think this is just something that uh, travelers, consumers are going to have to get used to for a while in terms of the level of service, or maybe, you know, this is new normal going forward? Yeah, I think some of it is, just going to be new normal. I mean, I think housekeeping, that was, there were already some, some hotels that you would stay at that will allow you to opt out um, maybe for environmental reasons uh, saying like, I don't need my towels washed. I'm all good. Um, So there were already some inches towards this idea of, is this an expectation or is this, you know, an added perk there was even some discussion of, of monetizing that housekeeping of saying, we'll mm. clean your room every day. It'll just be an extra $15 fee. Right. Uh, now I haven't seen any that have, that have actually implemented that, but um, I think that some of those things could be where the industry is going. Mm. But certainly if you have four hotels or four restaurants on your property, you're not hoping to close some of those off permanently. That's not what you're hoping for, for your new normal you're yeah. waiting to get that staffing level back up so that you can accommodate all of those options. And especially once some of those groups come back, if you're talking about a big convention hotel, they're not just hanging out in the banquet area. They're right. grabbing drinks with coworkers after the meetings. They're maybe having a business lunch at your restaurant. So once those groups come back, it may be almost a requirement of groups may not want to be at your hotel if you can't offer the full variety of services that they need. Yeah. So let's look forward. I know when we, you know, when I look at gas prices or grocery prices or everything going on in inflation in my daily life, I can't help but ask, you know, when is this going to end? When are we going to get some relief? When are the, if, if not prices going down, when are they going to at least stop going up? Um, and I, I think people are optimistic that at some point, you know, some policy, something will help that happen on the consumer, you know, daily spend side. When you look at your forecast for 23, 24, do you see hotel prices going down or leveling off or is it just uh, up and to the right? We see them leveling off a little bit, certainly not the astronomical growth that we've seen over the last couple of years, but mm-hmm. we are expecting them to continue to go up, which you know, depending on how you look at it is positive or negative from the guest side. It's, you know, it's harder to see some of those sticker shock prices that you mentioned, but um, certainly for the industry that was hurting so badly a couple of years ago, it's a welcome reprieve. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, it would not be a smart move for me to say, you know what, I'm not going to take my vacation in 22. I'm going to wait till 2023 (laughs) because I, because I'm hoping I'm going to get a better deal on hotels. You think that's not going to pay off for me? Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't count on that. Yeah. All right. Well, that is good to know. Hey, before I let you go, we've got a few uh, more questions. First of all, uh, where's the best place for people to find and follow either you or uh, STR? 
So STR, um, our website is Mm -hmm. str.com. We are also on social media. I believe the Twitter handle is Mm -hmm. strdata. There might be an underscore in there between str and data. Um, You can also go to Hotel News Now, which is actually now a part of um, CoStar News. Okay. And you can sign up for our free newsletter. You'll look at that every day, and that'll give you a good sense of what's going on in the industry, um, anything from really data-driven articles to interviews with hotel executives, really getting a a better understanding of the industry from there. All right. Well, we have a few questions we ask everybody uh, before we let them go. These are just for fun, so no pressure. Feel free to just uh, shoot from the hip. First of all, uh, is it a window seat or an aisle seat for you? Aisle. Yeah, me too. Uh, What is one thing in your carry-on that you wouldn't travel without? Um, A portable phone charger. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That is yeah, so power so, bank. Yeah. Heaven forbid you end up in a, an airport or a hotel lobby or something and you don't have that phone charger. It is a panic inducing for sure. Yeah. You also, you always become someone's best friend when you're at a conference <laughs> and their phone is dying. You, it's a good way to make a friend. Always be the one with the charger. Oh, smart. That's great. Yeah. Okay. So if you had a free airline pass and a week off of work, where would you be headed next? You know, Alaska is next Mm. on my list. Um, I just got back from a trip to Yosemite. Yeah. And um, I'm dying to add on some of those Alaska National Parks. Um, I've never been and just looks absolutely stunning. Oh, my gosh. Alaska. I've I've had the privilege of being there a few times. And uh, it everything people say about it is true. I mean, everything. Yes. It's it's just gorgeous. So, uh, yeah, I hope you are able to do that soon. So last question. uh, What's something you have seen or done on the road that you wish you could go back and do again with somebody you love? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, a lot of my favorite memories are already with the people that I love. So, mm. you know, I'd like to go back and do some of them again just to, you know, um, enjoy them a second time. Yeah. Yeah. What are some of the ones that stick out to you? Um, you know, I did a big road trip last year with some of my family. We went to uh, Wind Cave National Park, Badlands, nice. uh, Yellowstone and Grand Tetons. Yeah. Just had an absolutely wonderful experience. I'd love to just go back and see it all again with fresh eyes and uh, yeah, spend some more time with my family. Yeah, uh, that's amazing. Hannah, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate your insight and uh, being so generous with your time. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Hannah Smith, and I hope you found it helpful. Uh, A few highlights that I want to circle back to and make sure that you catch these because I think they are really important information. Uh, She said that what's going on in hotel pricing is affected by inflation, but it is not all based on inflation. Uh, Another way to look at this is hotel prices are rising faster than inflation. So uh, you can list hotels in there with things like healthcare and housing and education. Uh, that's all getting expensive at a faster rate than inflation overall. Another thing she said that I think uh, is worth noting is demand is continuing to build week after week. That's even as fuel prices increase. I'll be honest, guys, I have never seen an environment like this where fuel prices are going up. There is uncertainty in the world. Inflation is taking a bite out of everybody's paychecks. And yet more and more people want to travel. And as Hannah said, leisure demand is what's driving that pricing. So if you want to take a vacation this year, well, so does everybody else. And that's why prices at hotels are so expensive. Finally, Hannah said labor shortages were already becoming a problem for hotels before the pandemic began. And since the pandemic, uh, hotels have lost a lot of their staff and they're trying to do more now with fewer people than they have had in a long time. And she said, at a certain point, we have to get out of survival mode as an industry because it's just going to exacerbate those burnout problems we already had. And that brings us to the hot minute, the portion of the show where I take 60 seconds to give you my unvarnished views on issues impacting the travel industry today. 
Now, I have been hearing a lot recently from tour operators and other people who arrange group travel about how disappointed they are with the lack of service they're getting from hotels, especially the lack of baggage handling, which was a big part of the group tour service package for a long, long time. Well, I have some thoughts about service and particularly about baggage handling. So let's put 60 seconds on the clock and get into it. All right, I know some of you guys love having your luggage delivered to your rooms while on tour, but from where I sit, this is one group tourism convention that is ready to die. You know, maybe it made sense a long time ago when luggage didn't have wheels on it, but these days every piece of luggage has wheels and it is not hard to take your own bag to your own room. In fact, I haven't let a baggage handling service take my bag to a room in years because it is so inconvenient. I would much rather have that bag immediately when I want it, be able to bring it down when I'm done with it and not have to worry about baggage handling. Now, if you have clients that genuinely need help with their bags and you can't find hotels that have staff to do it, I have a novel idea for you. Take the bags to their rooms yourself. They're going to thank you for it. They're going to appreciate it. And you're not going to have to spend your time getting frustrated over whether or not your hotel contacts can promise baggage handling. That's the way I see it. If you disagree, well, I'd love to hear from you. We can still be friends. If you have other thoughts, comments, suggestions, send them to us, podcast at grouptravelleader.com. You never know, your thoughts just might be the topic of the next hot minute. Hey, while you're in the mood to give us some feedback, don't forget to go to your favorite podcasting service, give us a review, give us a rating. That really helps us get the word out about what we're doing, and we are grateful for you doing that. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode of Gather and Go. My thanks once again to Hannah Smith of STR. Thanks to you for listening. On the next episode, we're going to have a feature conversation with Scott Brodsky of Country Heritage Tours, who is going to tell us all about building a niche travel brand and how his family built a travel brand unlike any other. You won't want to miss it. Until then, remember this. At the end of the day, we are all on this trip together. So let's make it a good one. See you next time on Gather and Go. Gather and Go is hosted and produced by me, Brian Jewell. Our publisher is Mac Lacey. Donya Simmons is our creative director. Ashley Ricks is our circulation manager and graphic designer. Our sales team is Kelly Tyner and Kyle Anderson. To advertise on the podcast, call Kelly or Kyle at 888-253-0455. Gather and Go is a production of the Group Travel Leader. For more information about our magazines, podcasts, and events, visit us online at grouptravelleader.com.